Hello, hello, hello. This is Corey Thompson from Above Board TV and Dice Tower Dish. And this is the pod father of gaming, Stephen Bonacor. You are listening to Board Games Insider, episode 311. And we're recording this on Pi Day, March 14th, 2024. <laughs> it is Pi Day. And Board Games Insider is proud to be powered by Board Game Geek. Corey Thompson feels like I was kissing you just a day ago in Las Vegas at Dice Tower West. And I was, Be but it was a couple what days. What happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. We don't talk about that. Yeah, I probably shouldn't tell people that yeah, I was kissing don't kiss you. Kiss and tell, man. Uh, you know, yeah, you it's told not. Told me I was special. You well, you are special to me, but I, you know, I'm 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 very comfortable kissing my friends and. And we had a great time. I mean, we did. We'll talk a little bit about that, you know, as we talk about what we've done over the last little bit of time. So tell me right now, what's happening in the world of Corey Thompson? Oh, man, it's been an insane week. So like you said, we were down in Vegas, Dice Tower West, had a fantastic time visiting with all my friends down there and Steven. Uh <laughs> So at West, I got to spend a lot of time with uh, new-ish designer Isaac Myers, who uh, is the founder and owner of Barnmade Games, and played just played the heck out of his new release, which is Expressions. Expressions yeah, is a card-driven deduction game. Basically, it's the clue system from the crew made into its own deduction game. Cooperative game. Uh, multiple players need to guess what's in each other's hands by giving clues. This is my highest green card. This is my only blue card. I have other sevens in my hand. Yep. These clues come out and you need to guess what's in other people's hands. It is so simple, easy to explain, and so fun. It's so well done. And Isaac, the designer, is just an amazingly nice person. He was kind enough to show me his coming prototypes. And I have to tell you, Expresso, the follow-up to Expressions, even better. Wow. Absolutely loved it. So let uh, me give a couple of comments there, too. I played the <laughs> crap out of Expressions, and I introduced it to all these people. I was going to talk about it during my se segment, but we might as well give a huge shout-out to uh, uh, Isaac Myers and what's the company? But backdoor barn door games? barn made games. barn made games and it's his, written his, in the script. Is but <laughs> I, I scrolled down already and uh, yeah, he and his wife, lovely people. Um, just and the game is just amazing. I mean, simple three, two rules in the game, and you're just trying to figure out every exactly card. Exactly the, the sort of love simple it. game I love. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is a game, and of course, Corey bought. 24 ish two cases of the game and it'll be handing yeah, out like a madman yeah something like that awesome it's dude. funny isaac came up to me at vegas he just sat down at my table looked me in the eye and went who, who the heck are you because people keep coming by and buying it saying that Corey said that it's good you <laughs> might you might be an influencer <laughs> You know, I, I created your influencing, but you did. that's okay. You did. You're an it's influencer. like a Frankenstein monster kind of thing. <laughs> I also got to spend a lot of time with the French contingent. So I spent time with Cedric, the owner of Captain Games, and we played sides. And I visited with uh, his daughter, Gwendolyn, who were absolutely delightful people. And Johan Levitt, who I've not spent a lot of time with before. He's a co-designer of Turing Machine. He was there with his new prototypes, and they were amazing. I absolutely loved them. Temple Code is such an interesting mastermind-style deduction game with yeah. cards. Uh, I believe it's coming soon, uh, but uh, it was it's, it's, it's out in France yeah. next month uh, well, from... BlackRock, I think. That's correct. So BlackRock picked it up in France. They're looking for English uh, distributor, English uh, co-publishing. It's licensing complicated, agent. but yeah. it'll be coming. It's really good. Yeah, that's a good one. And and so, the other one we can't talk about because, you know, like Play to Z might have picked up the prototype of this other game. So we don't want anybody to know about it. I have it here in my house. <laughs> <laughs> and Corey's going to bring it to the Gathering of Friends so we all get to play it with Zev. So that's... That one it's looks amazing. amazing. It does. And then uh, once Vegas wound down on Monday, I drove from Vegas back to my home where I'm hosting 
Cephala Fair. So the company is having a corporate retreat here. I've got about 20 people from Cephala Fair. Uh, Isaac Childress is here. Price Johnson, who runs uh, the, the company and the business side. And a uh, friend of the channel, Rob Rouse, is here. Rob so Rouse. There- Rob Rouse, yeah. who's not affiliated really with Cephala Fair in any way, he gets invited. Tell Rob, tell Rob that I'm going over to his house and Christina and I are going to hang out. I bet he's going to really enjoy hearing that. I didn't make the guest list, man. I You're not- <laughs> They are so nice. They are not letting me do anything. They're basically just took the yeah. house and they're feeding me and entertaining me. And, and we're having such a good time. That's really they cool. They all arrived yesterday over the course of the day, trickled in. Yeah. And uh, it's it's just an amazing group of people. I'm yeah. so lucky to have them here. It's really I'll, nice to do I... that. The, yeah. uh, the infamous archival shelving has been built <laughs> and installed. Oh. And I've been calling everybody and just showing them movies of moving the shelves around. It's They are so crazy. Uh, the short story is uh, friend Barry found out that a science fiction magazine was giving away their archival shelving and now it's at my house. And these are the large metal shelves with the gear mechanism on the side so you can move them along tracks so that they they pack together and uh, my garage is full of them now it is incredible everyone with a huge second house where they host board game conventions and corporate board game (laughs) retreats needs to have a set of archival library shelving so uh yeah i I recommend them they're really cool he called (laughs) Corey calls me while I'm, I was in the middle of a game online and he calls it. He goes, you got to see this. I'm like, oh, okay, let me, oh, good. I'll, I'll get back to you, man. I, I got to get back to this, my role playing game. But that was, yeah, they're beautiful, man. That's so cool. It is. Yeah. It is so amazing. And now I'm going to say the most bougie statement I've ever oh, said my in my life. God. Go ahead. Barry yeah. is currently refinishing my bocce court. <sighs> wow. And I'm still not invited over, you know, bocce being like in my blood, sort of. So what's going on with you? How's your bocce court and archival shelving? (laughs) I don't, I have neither bocce court, archival shelving, or a model T in my garage like you do. (laughs) So um, over at the uh, the podfather of gaming, um, uh, just going to mention a couple of quick little things. Um, You know, as we talked about, uh, Dice Tower West was amazing. Um, Big shout out to Tim Mavetier and uh, uh, his uh, partner for Tim Dice Star West, David, I can't remember his last name off the top of my head. I'm sorry. So Tim and David, they run such a good show. You know, it's branded with the Dice Tower, but they run the show and and Tom and gang do do shows, presentations, uh, you know, top 10 lists. They do like one a day of those things. But but really, uh, it's in the end, it's it's this is Tim and Dave's thing it used to be MeepleCon. they rebranded it it's an amazing show and for people on the west coast to have that show in a great city like las vegas you really if you're listening to this podcast right now i highly recommend checking out dice tower west las vegas first week in march every year you will not be disappointed things Definitely that i a show for playing games it is so well set up for that it is a playing games show, like period. The, any other entertainment is either the Vegas entertainment or, uh, you know, a little bit of, of what the Dice Tower does. But it really is. I got a chance not only to find expressions there where I showed it to everybody. Uh, um, I I played uh, Ticket to Ride. I'm sorry, Ticket to Ride. Thunder Road Vendetta five oh, yeah. times it was there was two copies on the hot games table so i played that like five times and of course i got a chance to play war of the ring twice once i had uh uh with my good friend trey lennox he's a brand newbie to the game and uh he he did his homework we played it in three hours he had a great time and he beat me and then i played against an experienced player we played the game in two hours like speed it was amazing playing it at wow. a really nice rate and uh I beat him. I beat him handily. So I feel like, okay, I can play against experienced players and actually compete. Not that I care. That game is about the experience of playing. It really is. So it was great time in general. Now, um, 
home for four weeks, which is wonderful. I might have to make a trip to New Jersey for family. Uh, but then I'll see Corey and a whole bunch of industry and non-industry people at the gathering of friends where we'll, some of us will also be there early enough to see the total eclipse, which is passing directly through Buffalo, Niagara. Kind of cool. Yeah. I'll be nearby. It'll be great. That's going to be great. Um, by the time you hear this, the Ascending Empire Zenith Edition Kickstarter will be done. It obviously funded about 300% over goal. Um, oh, 600 backers. Things went well. Uh, you know, not a million dollar Kickstarter like uh, Thunder Road Vendetta's new edition coming out, but it, it did very well. So uh, you can, of course, still go to the page and go and do a late backing. I think you'll love it. The uh, we did uh, the guys at Man versus Meeple did a really nice thirty minute playthrough. They played through basically the whole game. They just gave you a great overview of a few turns. So if you like, well, I really don't know. Do I need another four X game playable in an hour? You know, I like Last Light. Maybe do I need this one? Check it out. You can go there, watch their thirty minute playthrough. And I got to I got to check out the near final edition of it. They had a copy at um, at West, and uh, it looks slick. And I. It's a flicking game as well. Uh, we, I keep forgetting to mention that. it's. I think that's what really makes it stand out, and makes it unique, is it has, you can play it either with or without this flicking element. Yeah. And it brings back memories of Disc Wars and these old style flicking right. 4X games. It's. Right. I think it's amazing. So for, right, 4X, you know, uh, explore, expand, uh, exploit and exterminate. I always yeah. try to try to remember. So that first thing, that explore, is the is the part where you will flick your ship to try to get to a planet. And it's it's not hard. It's not like crocodile where if you don't hit it exactly right, it's going to go in the wrong. You know, you get and you get two flicks like as an action to get your ship. And there's other combat things to do with with uh, with the flicking. So it's a, a mechanic in the game, and you can, as Corey mentioned. Play without it, there's actually a variant rule. If you're like, I hate flicking, I can't do it. That's just one little part. You can play without it. I love that part because it makes it really stand cool. out so much. And by the way, Corey, you saw the final version. There's, the only thing is going to be a tweak to the mold for like the insert. Yeah. I mean, it's like it, yeah. it's like literally it. We, it's not the mass production. It's not the mass production it's, copy. It is what the final is going to look like. It's, and it's gorgeous. For mm -hmm. all intents and purposes, that's the game. So anyway, you can go. Go to Kickstarter. You can either type Play 2Z or Ascending Empires. You'll find it. Go late back if it makes sense for you to do so. And now let's get over to the event deck. So, Corey, I don't know if we can mention this first thing here, which I, okay. And he, he wrote, do not say it yet. We have some news. I know that is, you'll read right off the script. <laughs> I read, do not do it yet. <laughs> so, thank you very much for for making sure that I didn't spill news that is not necessarily confirmed. Because, what, because literally, guys, we want we want to bring you the news as soon as we can, but we want to make sure it's right. So Corey yep. found this thing out. We believe it to be true, but we're working through confirmation on it. So stay tuned. Um, interesting one here. Now, um, Corey, you put it in here, but this this is this has kind of been out there. It's about the game Puerto Rico which was the number one rated ranked game, number one on BGG for many years. Yeah. Of course, new games come out and they people have more hype, more gamers, things things change. But Puerto Rico is an amazing game. It it's absolutely a classic. is. It's a classic. So, it's an amazing game. Uh, yeah, and it spawned, it spawned a bunch of things. Came out in 2002. But Corey, there's been a little controversy over the new edition that Awaken Realms is doing. Why don't you talk exactly. about that? Exactly. So it was a Spiel recommended game in 2002, like you said, top of the list and everything by uh, Andreas Seyfarth. And it inspired a whole bunch of follow up games, the most recent of which um, basically rethemed Puerto Rico. Um, it's controversial. The theming of Puerto Rico is very much colonialism, and there's a lot of not so cool theming in there on top of a somewhat themeless Euro game. So they redid the theming for Puerto Rico and uh, brought it into the golden age. There was a period of time where Puerto Rico was independent and was doing very, very well. And they're, they're bringing it to, uh, to show the, the beauty of the island. Um, and that had its issues. Uh, it had a Kickstarter. There were some troubles getting it out. When it did come out, there were some production problems. So the new edition 
had a couple little bumps along the way. Still a fantastic game. Then recently, and this is what our news is really talking about, there was a deluxe edition of this new Kickstarter. And it was found out that there was a lot of AI art in the new edition of Puerto Rico. Uh, and Awaken Realms revealed at the beginning of the month um, that there was going to be a Q3 uh, special edition. Um, and then Ravensburger came in and said, uh, we won't do it with AI art. And there was a little bit of controversy there and it's been pulled and retooled. Um, so again, we're talking about the use of AI art in board games and uh, the community, you know, obviously has a lot of concerns about AI art. And this was an example that uh, the industry came in and said, well, we're not going to do that. We're going to we're going to retool, we're going to rework and we're going to come back and do it better later. Yeah, I you know I'm gonna disagree about the themeless nature of Puerto Rico. Is the only thing I disagree with you said because I think Puerto Rico for for a you know a Euro game has got a lot of theme. It, it, it but it is a theme that is controversial in a lot of ways because it does deal with colonialism and slavery, though they don't say it. So um, I it's pretty clear that that's yeah, yep. Absolutely. It's yeah. absolutely is. It's a, but it's a great game. Uh, hopefully they'll, and they have stated now there'll be no AI art, AI art in the right. final and edition. This, this stems from a release of a cover uh, of the special edition of Puerto Rico 1897, which is the, the new version. And the cover had AI art. Ravensburger stepped in and said, pull that, we're going to do something else. And a lot of times, this has been discussed a little bit, a lot of times publishers will use AI art during the uh, development and production of a game just as a placeholder. And I think that might be what happened is they had a placeholder art that was AI and they just let it go through. And so now they're saying, no, we're not using that. Um, but it's interesting, Ravensburger stepped in and stopped uh stop the project with the ARs said we're yep. gonna redo it. Very interesting. So this one is like when when my geeky worlds collide. NASA, yeah, that NASA is really has released a DD 5e compatible campaign which takes the players on a mission to save the Hubble Space Telescope. So they've combined a little bit of it's, it's actually they've combined a little bit of science fiction because it just disappears. I, I read I, I went into this and I read a little bit about what's going on. Yeah, this this the Hubble Space Telescope, right? One of the most iconic things that have ever been up in there for 25 years, taking pictures of the heavens now replaced air quotes by the James Webb Space Telescope. And you, you're out there doing a role-playing game based on trying to find it and save it from whatever happened to it. I I can't get I, I I saw this and I'm like, I don't know if this is a nice little, and it's a module kind of thing. And I don't know if this is going to be a great adventure to do in the 5e world, but this is like a crossover for me that like they probably, they came to me, they looked at my background and my likes <laughs> and they said, oh, We'll do this for Bonacore. I was just, it's, you know, it's it's just so it's tangential yeah, to everything. did it just for Bonacore. Just for me. It's tangential to everything in gaming, but it's so cool that they did this. You can go over and you can Google NASA D&D 5E Hubble, and I guarantee you'll find it, this it little adventure. Wild story. So, yeah, it's a wild, cute little story. So, Corey, we, you know, while we were having fun, and we were having fun at Dice Tower West in Vegas doing all kinds of bad boy things. <clears throat> Not really. And and playing lots of great games. Gamma, the Gamma Expo, was happening in Louisville, Kentucky. Yeah. And allegedly it was a phenomenal show with great attendance in this new location. Any so more Gamma Expo, of course, is the invite only well, not invite only. It is the business to business trade show. So right. to go to Gamma, you have to be a member of the association. So a retailer, a designer, a publisher, media. Distributors. It really is not a for public 
convention. It's where right. they show off new things coming up and take pre-orders and make deals. Right. I've gone for years and I felt really bad not going to this one, but Louisville was a was a long trip for me to try to justify in the middle of every everything else I was doing. So it's nice to hear that uh, this is the first year in Louisville. Gamma does uh, deals three years at a time. So they had three years at Reno, which uh, was very easy for me. And now they're doing three years in Louisville. And they did great. Um, so like you said, record attendance at Gamma yep. 2024. And uh, 34% uh, up from the year before attendance-wise, uh, 2,700 in 36 people. That's a very big number for a, a gamma trade show. Now, of course, bringing it toward the east actually, of course, helped a lot. It was it was in Reno. It was in Vegas. Good attendance. It went to Reno. People, people it's hard to get to Reno, especially if you're like taking long. The hotel trips. was great. The venue was yes. great. Yes. It just was very difficult for travel for most people. And we had the worst luck <laughs> in that I think two of the three years in Reno. It got snowed out when everyone was trying to leave. It was, it was, and one of the years COVID hit and people couldn't leave oh, it was because horrible. all flights were canceled because of COVID when COVID very first hit. Yeah. So Reno was kind of a bit a bit doomed. A, a bit cursed uh, it being in Reno. But uh, this looks great. The number of exhibitors were up by almost the same percentage, around 35% as well. So uh, overall sounds like a great show. Um, I the I didn't hear any major announcements come out of Gamma, but are we able to talk about this other thing? I think yes, we are able to because not only did you reach out to some people, you know what I'm talking about, right? It's three three things down there, Corey. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we but there's a press release. You found a press release. There's a, a press release. So Corey and I had found out a source at a Gamma that told us this story. We were going to report it, but of course they also released a press release the same day we found out. You you would have heard about it anyway. So let's go down to that story right now. Absolutely. This came, this came at a Gamma, and that Asthma Day, who who are the owners, is the owner, of Miniature Market in the U.S., right? The right. largest hobby board game online store. They were the owners. They're now selling Miniature Market back out. And the the people who are buying it are people who are ex Day employees, I heard. Is that is that what you've got out of this? Well, they were also, I believe, running Miniature Market. So it's essentially selling it to to them. So it's being sold to Christophe Arnaud and Maude de Combe. And Maude is the CEO of Miniature Market. So the off the press release, and this is fresh as of yesterday. Right, as of 3.13. Uh, Miniature Market, a prominent feature in the tabletop community, is thrilled to announce a significant development in its journey as it prepares to welcome seasoned industry vet veterans as its new owners. With a wealth of experience and expertise in tabletop gaming sector, Christophe Arnaud and Maude de Combe are poised to lead Miniature Market into a new era of growth and customer excellence. So uh, it sounds like it's a buyback. Um, but I, I'm really thrilled to hear Maude from what I hear uh, from several different sources is just thrilled to death and ready and loves this company and is going to to really work to make miniature market you know continue to be the great store that it is what I'm interested about is Asmodee also owns the European store Philibert which is one of the biggest online stores in Europe based in France and uh, waiting to see if they're just going to divest from stores from retail presence or if there's a lot happening because uh, we've talked about it before. Uh, Asmodee's parent company, Embracer, is down and uh, basically is tightening purse strings. So uh, there's a little bit of money, virtual money loss that happened because of some deals a little while back. So this, I think, might be a response to that, a little bit of selling, a little bit of tightening of strings. Right. Uh, as an aside with that, um, Embracer Group, which owns Asmodee and many, many other companies, is actually starting to lose some of their video game companies as well. Several of the video game companies under Embracer are buying out and becoming independent again. So uh, it's a it, it's a swing. It's a roller coaster. So this is a swing point for Embracer Group. 
Very, uh, yeah, and it's it, as you implied there, it's going to be very interesting to see if this is a trend, if they're going to remove themselves out of retail. Not that they have a lot of retail, but they certainly do, as you said. Um, Two really big stores. Some some big stores in, in France in particular, but that's where Asmodee's uh, corporate is also located. So we'll see how that plays out. So here's something we found, uh, you found it on Board Game Wire. I did not see this one come up. And uh, it's about a bankruptcy for Ninja Division and some big implications here? Yeah, so uh, off of their press release, uh, and this is from ICV2. Okay. Ninja Division, the troubled miniatures game publisher, which raised more than 3 million via Kickstarter for a string of tabletop projects, has filed for bankruptcy. The company's voluntary bankruptcy petition said it had liabilities in the range of uh, one to ten million, with assets between zero and a hundred thousand. Uh, not great, and up to forty-nine creditors. Uh, Ninja Division made a name for itself as a successful tabletop games Kickstarter business in 2014 when it raised one point two million from more than sixty-five hundred backers to fund Super Dungeon Explorer: Forgotten King. So Super Dungeon Explorer is its line, its most popular line, which launched in 2011. So this is another publisher having troubles. Yep. And I, we're seeing a few of these, and it could be a backlash from uh, general downtrends from COVID, from pandemic days, from mismanagement. There's been all sorts of reasons, but yep. we're always going to see new yep. companies pop up and old companies yep. go away. Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna point out, Corey, that this uh, you you were reading from uh, Board Game Wire, and they're they're a nice small company. Oh, I'm sorry. That's apologies. fine. I just want to make sure we got we mentioned them first. Then you sell. I see if you do. This is from Board Game Wire. Very very nice uh, uh, group of people over there uh, who just started up. Um, but um, what my commentary on this is is as I've said in the past, buyer beware. Kickstarter is not a pre-order system. If if you don't deal with companies that have good track records, you may not get anything. You can scream, you can get online, you can wave your hands, and but you may not get something. Now, this one goes a little bit crazier. Like, how is it possible, Corey, to raise $3 million on Kickstarter, Corey, and yes. not be able, and, and just go into bankruptcy? I, I just, that boggles my mind. What did they do? Did they go buy a building? Did they go buy a house or something like that? And they say, well, I'll go to house everybody over here. You know, I mean, I just. It's not I, the only story that's been this way. No. I mean, you've seen numbers of Kickstarters. I mean, we don't have a bankruptcy, but Mythic has had multi-million dollar campaigns and is having all sorts of financial troubles. And it's, there's a long list of those. There's a long list of people. This might be, I might, I might get in trouble for saying it, that really mismanage their business. And that's really what it comes down to. When you can raise that much money, you know, uh, with uh, it's OPM, other people's money. That's a term yes, in business. Yes. If you could raise $3 million in other people's money and you can't deliver on something, I, I find that astonishing. The, the way it was explained to me best is you have a big company. It has a whole bunch of different costs. You have to pay people. You have to pay employees. You have to pay for production, services, future things. The analogy is uh, the old story that you have a dog. You're going to go away for a week. So you pour all the food into the bowl and you go away for a week. The dog will eat all the food on day one, get ill, and then not be well for the rest of the week. And, and this not, is how a lot of the companies go. They yeah. have their entire budget for the next several years given to them in one lump on a Kickstarter. And it takes really intelligent planning. It's hard to do to figure out how to run your company for three years on one check now. And a lot of companies will fall down that slippery slope and they will run a second Kickstarter to fund oh. the problems they have with their first, and then a third to fund the problems they have with their I, second, and they just end up spiraling down that hole. I'm I'm going to disagree with one sentence only. You there, one, are a one guy. Would un yeah yeah. Well, thank you. I'm a business guy, and with so many other companies who are good or there are who are responsible who are and who understand business machinations and the fact that here is my money. And now I will spend it to do the thing I need to do. It's intelligent not, budgeting. Not just like, I don't know, let me go out and buy computers and assets and things. You, you got to be smart. So it's 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 a shame. I feel bad for the backers, but caveat 
emptor, you got to beware of Kickstarters that, you know, that don't have a background. We are, we are too used to Kickstarters running, you know, smoothly good yeah. companies running good Kickstarters right. and being reliable. Yeah. And that is not what Kickstarter was based on. Kickstarter right. is based on you find Bob in the street. He's got a neat idea. You give him money and you hope that he produces a product. Exactly. So here on the opposite side of going into bankruptcy is coming out of bankruptcy, which is wonderful story because we reported that Haba family group went into bankruptcy and now they're emerging from their insolvency proceedings after layoffs and restructuring. Yep. Um, and this includes a workforce reduction of over 600 employees. So Haba is a serious, serious company. Oh, it's a huge company, yep. mostly in furniture. It, it, in it weird, was really interesting digging into how many different things Haba does. Children's things, children's furniture. I think it's even children's clothing, toys, all this stuff for kids. The German company, parent of U.S. game and toy division Haba USA, exited the insolvency proceedings under self-administration on February 29th, 2024. And they nice. entered this in September and when they announced lots of layoffs and stuff like that. Uh, and the strategy Hobbit is kind of the the poster child of children's board gaming in our hobby side of the industry. So all the yellow box children's games, they win more uh, Kinder Spiel awards than any other company. Yeah. They're they're kind of the gold standard. See, that's a pun because of the yellow boxes. They're the gold uh, standard. Very good for children's gaming. But it's true, they really are. And, and and those kids' games are playable by adults with their kids. It's, you know, there's oh, yeah. actual meaningful things you do in those games, which makes them so satisfying to show your kids, well, not every game is Candyland, you know, things Absolutely. like that. Absolutely. Rhino Hero, Animal on Animal. Yep. Um, they're so, yep. so fun. Right. The strategy for Haba in the future is focused on high quality toys and games aimed at children's development. The company said in its announcement, a steering committee to advise management and an internal restricting expert. I love that. I love that name. Will supplant management going forward. This comes from ICV2. So very good news for Haba, a very wonderful company that I really, really, really want to succeed. What do we got here with this uh, German on another board game wire? Uh, so this is board game wire, and it's a little bit of a an accusatory article. <gasps> but I Jacques. Know. Jacques. <laughs> I love so, that. And it has to do with uh, standards, consistency, and board game designers. Uh, I, From interviewing all sorts of board game designers, one of the things that I've really seen is there is no standards for a contract with a designer, the method of payment that publishers will give designers, how they get royalties, how they own their product, every contract is different. So Gamma theoretically exists to try to at least inform and regulate those extremes. So Gamma is supposed to represent the retailers, the publishers, the designers, and the media. And there's been complaints back and forth about how much Gamma represents those sides. So in Europe, there is a board game designer association called SAZ, and my German is, is pretty good, but not good enough to remember off the top of my head what SAZ stands for, but it is an association, an organization for the designers. Uh, Jeff Engelstein is starting a new association in the U.S. called the Tabletop Game Designers Association. Yep represent board game creators in North America. So coming back to the point, Board Game Wire has a really interesting article that German game designers in their SAZ organization are calling out questionable practice that publishers have over royalty payments. There's been a couple stories over the past few years where designers are either not given the royalties they were promised, not paid at all, um, and some of it are, like you said, some publishers are not business people and some publishers run out of money before they pay their people. It's the reasons are infinite. So yeah. it's just a really interesting article. And it's also spotlighting the new association in the U.S., uh, the Tabletop Game Designers Association. Yeah, and uh, it's very interesting you mentioned. I was speaking with Jeff Engelstein yesterday about uh, our co-design game and about a few other things that we we needed to uh, talk about. And uh, there, this came up 
the Tabletop Game Designers Association, which is going to be the analogy to SAS in Germany. Um, going to be a game designers are going to be able to sign up. They're going to be able to get contract reviews. They're going to be able to get templates for contracts. All exactly. resources that would be great, you know, for someone who's just new to the industry to review to make sure these are good clauses. These are not so good clauses. It's and things pretty like much that. a jungle out there for a new designer. It is. Um, it absolutely is. So, um, um, so this is an interesting article, um, which was on Board Game Wire. The German game designer says talks about the sketchy royalties and look forward soon to the tabletop game association. It's actually Corey launching by the end of the month. Jeff is putting the final dotting the I's, crossing the T's and all that on the association. And it'll launch for people to actually sign up, which is really cool. We have one more that literally showed up in my inbox and I don't have much more information because most of the details on here would not be as interesting to people. But this is a very important story. The Embracer Group, the parent company of Asmodee, has officially ceased all operations in Russia through the divestment of selected assets from the operating group Sabre Interactive. Now, what is Sabre wow. Interactive? Sabre Interactive is one of their um, uh, development groups, electronic Program, programming, right? So for their video games, it's one of their development groups. Very often companies have developers in third world countries or in, you know, developing countries. Russia's, Russia's always had a, a lower um, cost to do business in. So they had group, the Saber Interactive was in, in Russia. They're leaving Russia. I applaud them for leaving Russia. Um, right now, I'm not going to get political here, but I am, you know, this it's, it's a time not to be doing business in Russia. So they've sold it, uh, those assets to another Russian investment group of some type, uh, and they're out. And that is a good thing in general. So with that, we are done with the news. That was a lot of interesting news this week, my friend. Yeah, get, that was crazy. I know. I mean, really, we you go from a week where like barely anything happens, right? For even for a month sometimes, and all of a sudden it's like, whoa, this is a lot of stuff happening. And with Gamma just ending, we're probably going to get a nice little pile of news next week as well. We probably will. But in the meantime, let's get to strategy and tactics. All right, we'll take a few questions here because we are running kind of long today with that big amount of news we just did. Uh, this we first have, one's for Ignacy. Oh, is this an Ignacy one? Make sure it's nice and bold there so that I put it and rip it out and put it someplace else. Make it bold. Come on, Corey. Do, do the right thing for me, will you? All right. The next one, as Corey does that, Peter Van Hook from Belgium. He's Pieta VH on the Geek. A few years ago, you talked about bringing out less titles because the market got more and more saturated with hobby games. We talk about it a lot. It is absolutely true. He says yeah. like a gazillion titles released at Spiel. 2,000 titles released on that one day, 1,800 of them you'll never hear about again the day after. It's, it's, it will. is astonishing. You, you may, but the rest of the world won't. And then 100, you know how it is. It's the same thing every year. Did you follow up on that idea or did you even publish more titles? Hmm. Since Stephen was not active then as president of Stronghold, he can answer as well, but Corey, you can't. So this is sort of an Ignacy question too. To answer but this question, if I may. You can answer. Go for it. You want I, to answer? Yeah. I, I published no titles before, <laughs> and then I continued my trend to not publish titles. Right. So no, it's not a publisher. Yes. Not at well. You are you are a little bit. I am bit sort now. of a publisher now. A so. little bit now. You're a one fifteenth ish, whatever the number is. So the the the, the short answer is um at that time where we started talking about that was right around the time of uh, when when I sold the company, uh, merged, and then got bought out over time with Indie Boards and Cards, creating Indie Game Studios, which is going strong. Um, and it was a time where people were then pivoting, like literally pivoting. Like it was a time when that year, um, uh, AEG announced that they were going to do four titles a year. And that was it. And maybe even less sometimes. Uh, many AEG companies. was really the big one that they were called out for putting out so many titles. And they made the announcement that they were limiting their right. title release. And Stronghold absolutely was putting out too many games because of our partnerships, right? That was the business model. We wanted to bring great games from Europe and Asia to the U.S. market. And without us doing it, well, somebody else would have done it or it not wouldn't have gotten done. And you wouldn't have seen those great Freedom and Freeze titles and things like that. But anyway, um, 
Stronghold and Indy have certainly pivoted, and their new titles now number in the the handful. It's it's I you know I don't know the exact number. I haven't you know I'm not going to look at every little thing, but they certainly are bringing out very few new titles per year, like brand new, and then they're capitalizing, of course on their major IPs where everybody wants. You're going to see a little more Terraform. You're going to see more Aeon's End, right? All those things that people definitely want, those are going to be their focus. And uh, the new titles will, oh, look, it was, we found this great one. Let's try this one out as well. So the answer is mostly yes, that's exactly what happened. People are definitely still doing it. I've got interests in a lot of the companies. So I talk with, for instance, Lucky Duck and things like this. And the discussion is always... We have so many great titles we're looking at, we can't release them all. We need to limit how many titles are coming out. Uh, So it's definitely still very strong on publishers' minds. Absolutely. And even, you could take it further to WizKids had their recent restructuring that they are no longer doing acquisition or research on new titles. They're focusing on their existing titles and doing variants. So they're just not even looking at the new things out there anymore. Right. They're, they're exiting the board game market over time. They're going to bring out a few more that they had in the pipeline. Yeah. Essentially. The existing popular titles. Yeah. So Peter then asks, my wife also loves board games. That's great, Peter. During the pandemic, we shifted toward playing on board game arena with our friends, opened up a chat window, and we were good to go. Now she strongly prefers to play on BGA. No setup, no breakdown, not goofing up on the rules, no scoring counting. Did the pandemic change your gaming life? So Corey, I wow. I have I absolutely have an answer. Why don't I go? Yeah, first? I do as well. Uh So the big things for me, so I was involved with a lot of uh, development and playtesting and things of that sort. And I certainly saw two big shifts. Playtesting is, it's almost necessary to do it online, not on BGA, but on TTS for the most part. It's an absolutely necessary platform to develop, design, and show off a new game. And crappy one too. Well, any, yeah, it's no TTS it is what T- it is. TCS is what it is. It's a physics engine, but it's it's yeah, it's a necessary evil to show off your games. And but and that's but, absolutely a result of yeah. the pandemic and everybody working remotely. Yep. But the other big one I find really interesting is before the pandemic, the timeline, the the calendar for board game release was Gen Con and Essen nothing released outside of that and there was a ton of releases at the big conventions now because we skipped those conventions for uh, a year the timeline is loosened up and board games are releasing much more often off of that calendar which i find really interesting and i think that's a direct result of the pandemic we're getting more releases on off times they're not absolutely reliant on the big conventions which is probably good that also again spreads out releases for for the average gamer they can focus which makes them more popular because yes. they're not drowned in a whole bunch of other news absolutely so for me without a doubt the pandemic changed my gaming life but it mostly changed my role playing gaming life i got into yep. during the pandemic i got into two role playing i hadn't role played at that point in, let me say six years or something like that, because <laughs> I left New Jersey. I, I had I had ended a campaign and didn't restart it when I was in New Jersey for various reasons uh, and left. I have I have essentially no gaming group in Florida, had no gaming group. And then the pandemic hits and my New Jersey friends want to role play. They started some new campaigns and they invited Paula and I to join them. So. I've had a campaign in Pathfinder 1, and we've talked about this a lot with, with that group. I'm a level 16 half-orc fighter in that campaign, which is coming to a close after like three and a half years. I think it's going on four years. It's crazy. And uh, also started a campaign with a bunch of industry people. I've mentioned this in the past. In D&D 5, Alex Schmidt from Stonemeyer, the COO. He's the DM, and yep. Julie Ahern and Rachel Blasky. Uh, myself and Dustin Wessel uh, from now from now Arcane Wonders. He's with Arcane Wonders. So we and we're we're just loving that thing. We have now in our third campaign in that system over time. So it's made me so, and I love role playing. I absolutely do it. 
if I had to choose one in my life, would I choose role playing a board game? I'd probably choose board gaming, but I love role playing. Yeah. I love, I love almost the acting process that occurs where you have to think like a different person being and, and bring that out in a, in a material way. So um, great question. Um, for board gaming, by the way, it did not change anything, really. I mean, a little bit of online gaming, but I'm not really an online gamer. I, I personally have a lot of trouble actually playing a game online for fun. For business, I, I have to, yeah. and I do it all the time. But I still play the majority of my for fun board games in person. Very cool. You know what? I think we're going to end here because we have taken a lot of time Uh Peter, thanks for those two good questions. He's got another one coming up. We're going to take that on the next show. But now, in the meantime, let's get over to playtesting. All right, Corey. So uh, last week, you asked a question. Why don't you? Uh, why don't you read that question? So, uh, I found it interesting. It's come up with me a couple times. Is it okay to leave in the middle of a game? And when is it okay to leave in the middle of a game? There's often these situations where you're playing a game, you might not particularly be having a good time with it, you don't enjoy it, but then you double think and it's like, am I ruining someone else's enjoyment by leaving? When is it okay to not not rage quit, but you know, to yeah. leave a game with multiple players? And of course we had the the footnote that, you know, floods, famine pestilence tragedy you know <laughs> yeah. these these are acceptable reasons no one could argue if an earthquake occurs and you've got to get to shelter you know that's... by the way been there yeah <laughs> i imagine living on the west coast that might have happened to you wow i yeah never experienced actually technically i have experienced a new jersey earthquake which is not you know a little rumble kind of thing happened a couple oh of that's times. cute yeah it's, it's so cute you experienced a two on the richter scale actually one of them was a four so it was like, like whoa, what's that? Oh, there you go. Anything. But that's pretty pretty minor, too. Uh, and I got to apologize to everybody out there. You even see in the title of the playtesting for 310, it says, sorry, uh, I, de I delayed this. I forgot to post the question because of last week's craziness. So we don't have a lot of answers. We have a dozen of them, but we'll get and we'll get to a few the way we normally get to a to a bunch. So let me just sure. start picking. John Kinas, he's at Rishni. Uh, he says, I think you're mostly outlined and discounted the only valid reasons for leaving a game mid-play. In other words, like tragedy, earthquake, something serious. Otherwise, in my opinion, it's only acceptable if, one, the game rules allow for it, like the concession rules and through the ages of Mag Magic the Gathering. Well, right. I mean, it's part of the rules, so you can simply say, I concede it's it's in the rules. That even counts as as quitting. Yes. Yeah, it's part of the rule I, set. Sure. I would, I would, I would, right. I would argue that that's, look, it's in the rules. I can do this if, right. Right. Yeah. There's mercy rules too. That wouldn't count either. Right. If you get 10 more points over the other one in a given thing, it says the game just ends. It's not even like an option at that point. Um, and he also says, you've made it clear before the joining the game that you need to leave early and other players accepted that. Very good. I mean, that's a very, very good way of thinking about it because if, if I sat down saying I, I have an hour, this is going to be an hour and 15. I have a hard out. I got it's a go. verbal contract. Yeah, it's beautiful. Beautiful way of putting it. Thank you, John. Thank you, Corey, for that. Corey, did you find any cool yeah, one in there? You uh, want to we point have out? Scott at Sham Blaise had a, a, a really interesting, strong. I, I see these as uh, strong answers and uh, mediation answers. So Scott said, respect the game and your peers, stay till the end. Leaving halfway through is one of the worst sins of board gaming. One of the rules of life is don't start what you can't finish. So I agree with this. If you have agreed verbal contract to play a game, it might kind of ruin people's experience if you leave. Exactly. Um, and uh, Gavin Kenny uh, from England, he says it's, you know, you just can't do it. He said, I've I've done it before at a game convention is in the middle of a game of hegemony and his wife called in an emergency. She couldn't get in. The, the, she was locked out. We'll get emergency. He, right. So these situations, everybody is saying the same thing at the moment. We haven't looked through everything that it's normally just not OK. So I think we'll all agree emergency situations yeah. don't count. Anything else? Well, we got Ben Stein at Ben One Music. Uh, 
and he says sometimes yes but if someone wants to leave a board game for non-emergency reasons i believe it should be a discussion with all involved and not an immediate unilateral decision the person who wants to leave should find out how much of an effect they will have by leaving the game will gameplay continue as if they were never there or will it disrupt the balance and affect who might win or lose the other players should find out if there are any conditions in which the person could stay the person who leaves may reduce the risk of having a miserable experience but increase the risk of not being invited back so again just don't be a jerk you know, to be kind to yeah. everybody, figure out where everybody else is. For all you know, everybody is having the same thought process. Everybody might be sitting there going, oh, when is this going to end? And just waiting for someone to open the discussion. Right, right. Elena, uh, who often uh, asks me and we talk um, in the YouTube channel uh, after she watches us there. So thanks for posting uh, your answer here. She says, this isn't a moral question, is it? Assuming there aren't obvious reasons why a person will leave a game, i.e. they have diarrhea, someone will pay them a million dollars uh, to leave stage two labor, you know, something like that. Wow, okay. those, those are some extremes. Yeah, I think those are okay if you left during those things. Um, I think it is poor etiquette to leave a game early if by leaving early you negatively affect the enjoyment of others at the table. When players enter a game, they enter a... Social, social contract. contract, right? Perfect. That awesome. everyone at the table will have some sort of fun. But I think a person can get take away others' ability to have fun by controlling the game. By leaving the game, they're minimizing potential for victory and other players' enjoyment who may have worked hard to earn that victory. Another player may have a strategy dependent on the player who chooses to leave. Or maybe by leaving, the game is broken because it requires a certain number of players. I love this. I mean, it's really outlining the whole thing. And she also goes on to say players who aren't enjoying themselves should verbalize it. Maybe yeah. there is a group dependent solution. Take faster turns, stop trash talking. When entering a game, expectations should be set so players know what kind of social contract they are entering, i.e. the game is 12 hours long and may or may not require signing over your soul to the devil. I am you know, not going I, to play a 12 hour game. I, I would consider playing a 12 hour game if the whole weekend was set and things. Well, yeah, you play Battlestar Galactica. <laughs> it's not 12 hours. But though I would I would consider playing a Mega Civ game, which basically is the Mega Civ 18 players. They're it reprinting is, it. I don't yes. know if you saw this. It was news we, recently. I think we I think we reported on it, in fact. We did. I think. If we didn't, we should have. It's a biggie. Yeah. So anyway, these are really great ones. I mean, I think, but but I think as you can see here, this is basically is a 100 percent unanimous. You don't leave a game if you started unless the world is on yeah. fire around yeah, you. And really I think good response to this question, given the short timing, it was up there. I really enjoyed reading these answers. Giving the short timing that Bonacor screwed up and did not have people, you know, giving well, them I was time. point out that it was entirely your fault that it, it got posted. Late. It was entirely my fault. So I have the question for this week and it was it was quickly put together. Uh, but it, it it goes back to what we talked about last week. So maybe we can have, it's kind of a yes, no question, but getting a little bit of more color around this would be interesting from everybody else. Sure. And my question now out to everybody else is, is a game design broken if a player can tank the game? This comes from the discussion about semi-co-op games and that one player could, if they were a problem player, lose the game for all players. And generally, do you think this issue is with the game design or the player. Now, Corey, we kind That's of talked the about focus it. focus of this. Yeah. Is it within the design of the game or is it the players? Because I've said over and over, there's so much variability in enjoyment. Like I can enjoy a truly terrible board game if the players are wonderful people and we have a great time. And on the opposite, I can play the, the greatest board game ever made and absolutely hate it if it's the wrong players. So it, it's this interesting balance between player etiquette and um, attention and intent with actual design. But I've heard people argue that it is all ingrained within the design of the game. A well-designed game should not allow players to be jerks, which I don't know if I argue with. Uh, it's a... Uh, it's a complicated subject, and I love just that last line. Do you think the issue is with the design or with the player? That's that's a really good point. 
Well, thank you very much for enjoying the way that I put that. Um, and yeah, I mean, and that is that is the crux of this thing that that you and I. I, I like to give you, you know, praise if I think you're being humanly intelligent, <laughs> which is very rare. But thank you. Um, <laughs> we I, and I talked about this at length, and I actually had I read something last week that it's absolutely not. A I design. had a big active discussion about this at Vegas. Actually, it was oh, really interesting. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah. Um, it's not a game design problem. It's a player problem. That is my opinion. You can have a different opinion. That's cool. But I strongly believe that, again, it's like a social contract, right? That we're playing this to have fun. And if I lose the game, I lose the game. So what? Um, so the game... Someone's does, gotta lose. The, someone's gotta lose. The game design is not bad if it's possible. Hey, I could play a Euro game with you. I could play a Euro game with you and completely destroy your experience if I want by doing everything to counter draft you maybe at the expense of this other person who I want to win or I like or whatever the case may be. So is the game design broken in a, in a themeless, you know, Euro game that is, is about min minimizing and maximizing and creating yeah. my engine. It's not broken. You're a bad player. If you would do something like that. So it's the same kind of thing. It's just happens. If more I can often. do like a, a tiny tangent, um, yeah. My father played a game with me when I was a kid, and I will fully admit that it was stolen off of a British comedy show. But um, <laughs> the game, we called it the fruit game, and I played it with my kids as well. The rules are very, very simple. You name a kind of fruit, and then the person you're playing with names a different kind of fruit, and you go back and forth, and you're not allowed to repeat, so you're thinking of new kinds of fruit. Whoever says banana first wins. And I have had so much fun playing this with gamers. Wins? You just win. If you say banana, you win. So I could just say banana and I win? And you win. And I will praise you for winning. But did you have fun? <laughs> no, of course not. No, you did not. That's awesome. Now, if That's pretty funny. played it out, if we go over and over and over and over, you get into this double think of, I want to say it right before you have to. <laughs> and it actually is fun so that i think is a good example of this is it the game or is it the player that's great oh so, that that is uh, I that have, is I beautiful have a strange father and uh yeah these are the games he taught me when i was a kid <laughs> you have your your father is amazing so i have just created that thread so now you have a full week to answer Are you sure the question you the i thread? did i did and i even put the link right there into the show notes please All go right. to the guild on bgg find our play testing thread for this question and post your answer to our question and i apologize again for screwing it up last week now let's get to the final scoring Thank you all so much for listening. Help us spread the word about this podcast by telling your friends to download Board Games Insider wherever they like to get their podcasts or watch Board Games Insider on the pod. I, I would recommend Gaming. just telling your friends that it's me and maybe not mentioning Monocle. <laughs> on the pod father of gaming YouTube channel. Do you want to be part of this podcast? You can just ask us questions for strategy and tactics or answer our question to you for playtesting in our guild on Board game geek easy to find go over there you can find it i know you're smart people check out the websites which are portalgamesus.com podfathergaming.com dicetowerdish.com and play2zgames.com we're all over social media so interact with us please on facebook please like our pages slash board games insider slash portal games us slash podfather gaming slash play to z games you can speak directly to Ignacy, Corey, and Steven on X and Instagram at Portal Games US, at Podfather Gaming, at Dice Tower Dish. And the YouTube channels are Portal Game, Portal Games Studio, the Podfather of Gaming, and Above Board TV. On TikTok for Ignacy, if it's still existing after you hear this, because <laughs> it might go away, it's Portal Games US. We really love to see you in person at an upcoming convention. We saw so many friendly people, Corey. We kept getting bumped into and people taking pictures. Was so it was so great to do that and people seeing us together want to take a group picture. So please always come up to us and hang out and chat and play a game with us. I, they I, all I, told me to continue to give you a hard time. They said that was their favorite part. I, I, You know, it may be my favorite part, too. Board Games Insider Professionally edited by Joshua Bowman from Tabletop Submarine Podcast. If you want it. 
your podcast to be added by Joshua, reach out to him at tabletopsubmarine at gmail.com. And that great voice you hear doing all of those intros and outros and stuff is Ray Greenlee. He can be contacted to do voiceover work at raygreenleevoiceover.com. Do you have anything to mention right here at the end as we go away? <laughs> No, just had such a good time at West. It was so nice to see everybody and uh, hoping to to continue to see people, you know, in, on all the conventions that we're yeah. going to. So, yeah, gathering, you know, is going to be an amazing thing. But that's, you know, we'll be talking about that in four weeks yeah. uh, when we're up there. Um, and Above Board is going to be filming around the eclipse in northern New York. We're actually going to be in Rochester filming the week before uh, the gathering. And we're going to be filming around the Strong Museum of Play. If you haven't gotten a chance and you're in the area, I cannot recommend this museum enough. They have such a wealth of history in their library of board games, toys, video games, pinball. They have originals. They have some of the original handwritten Magic the Gathering cards, some of the original D&D uh, handwritten notes and drawings uh, it, it's incredible how much stuff they have there i it's my favorite museum i've ever been to it's the strong museum of play in, in rochester. rochester new york fantastic place uh if you're ever in upstate new york you want to check it out until next time everybody thank you for listening thank you for watching we'll see you next time bye now see you later everyone <laughs>